audio is half your movie. You might have heard that phrase. Yet many filmmakers know tons about their cameras and video codecs and almost nothing about microphones and digital audio. In this video I will try to give an overview on the most important things about recording and working with digital audio. While this is not meant exclusively for filmmakers, I will try to explain things in a way that caters to their understanding and way of thinking a little more. Now, obviously this is a very broad field and I cannot cover anything and everything on it. I also cannot lose myself into details too much, so if you have any further questions, please feel free to ask me in the comments below or as a personal message on YouTube. It also means that this video is going to be a tad longer than your average YouTube video. So for the impatient viewers, I divided it into chapters. You can just click right now on the chapter that you're solely interested in, or you can use the skip forward and backward buttons and the menu button that will be present the rest of the video. The chapters are kind of ordered chronologically. The first thing to discuss is the positioning and different types of microphones. The second part is on the very little known pre-amplification of the signal. The third part is the most theoretical one and targets the actual digitalization of your audio signal and what settings to use for recording. The fourth and last part will introduce the most important audio filters and enhancements in post-production. So let's kick it off with some microphones. For filmmakers, there are three different types of microphones that are usually interesting. One is the lavalier microphone that is just clipped to your shirt or collar and it's very close to your mouth and it's visible in the image. So it's usually used for interviews or things like what I'm doing right now on YouTube. The second microphone is a shotgun microphone and it has a very narrow recording pattern, which means that it's only recording from what's coming di directly from the front and is dampening the sides. This is very helpful if you're recording a movie and the microphone has to be outside your frame, but still record what's coming from your mouth very closely. The third type of microphone is a studio mic. Now this is usually used for post-production like ADR or recording sound effects, but you don't really need it because you can also use your boom mic for that, your shotgun mic does almost the same job. So what do these microphones sound like in reality? This is me recording into a 30 euro condenser lavalier mic attached to my shirt. This is me recording into a 300 euro shotgun mic about 1.5 meters or 5 feet away from my mouth. This is me recording into the 100 euro Rode VideoMic Pro about 2 meters or 7 feet away from my mouth. This is me recording into a 2000 euro studio mic about 3 meters or 10 feet away from my mouth. As you can probably already tell, the positioning of your microphone is actually much more important than the microphone or the price of the microphone itself. A microphone that has a polo pattern, like the studio microphone or the lavalier I'm using, has to be as close to your source as possible. And if you're using a studio microphone, you would better have a dampening shield in the back or something that will reduce the amount of echo coming from your walls. Because it's just so sensitive, it, it will record everything in the room and that's not really what you want, you just want your voice. So get your microphone as close as possible to the subject. Now, obvi obviously if you're doing a movie, you have to use something else because you cannot hide a lavalier microphone as easily and also if actors move, you will hear kind of a, a scratching and probably some noise from the microphone. So what to do. So what professionals usually do is they use a shotgun microphone because it's very narrow, it only records what's coming directly in front of it and it dampens the sides. This is a great thing, but the problem with it is that it does not just amplify what's coming directly from the front, but it dampens what's coming from the side. That means that the signal that comes out of this microphone is usually very very low. Well, generally, signals coming out of microphones are very, very low and you have to amplify them before you can actually record them or convert them to digital audio. This means that you need a pre-amplifier. Most people forget about the pre-amplifier when they buy microphones and if you take a really, really expensive microphone and you put it through a really bad pre-amplifier, it will still sound like, well, crap. Alright, so for filmmakers there are actually four different kinds of amplifiers that might be interesting to you. One of them I don't possess, so I won't be showing you. But the other three are, for one, it's the preamp of your camera. In this case I'll have a Canon T3i or 600D in Germany. Um, and I'll just record straight into the microphone input and I, I can just set the amplification within the menu. You know that. I mean if you're using Magic Lantern, which I assume. The second one is what I'm recording into right now. It's a Zoom H4 and it has uh, XLR 
microphone inputs, which is already a lot nicer. It also has a non-XLR microphone in input, but that's usually not helpful if you're using a shotgun microphone because shotguns are XLR. So I will record into this one as well. And the third one I will be recording into is a uh, just a sound card, but it's a very nice sound card. It has Focusrite amplified, Focusrite preamps in there, and Focusrite preamps are like the holy grail of preamps, so to say. So there's very little noise coming from this, and you can probably hear a difference when I'm trying this out right now. So to record into the uh, Canon T3i with a normal shotgun microphone or a professional shotgun microphone, you need an adapter cable like this one. This has an XLR plug on one side and it has a uh, small phone plug on the other side, like 3.5 millimeters, I think. No, this is less. This is, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you Americans call it. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's try that out. So as you can see, the microphone is just outside the frame. It's about like 70 centimeters or 2.5 feet away from my mouth. So I will talk a little softer so you can hear the noise a little better. This is recording directly into the preamplifier of the Canon T3i. This is recording directly into the XLR input of the Zoom H4n. The preamplification is set to 80 if you also have the same device. This is recording into an audio device on my laptop with Focusrite Class A preamplifiers. So as you can see or rather hear, the preamplification also matters a lot. This is why uh, I do have a Rode video mic, but I only use it for my camera to not have as crappy audio as if I was recording on the onboard mic. I'm trying to get my mic as close as possible to the person, which is usually not where the camera is. And I'm trying to use a decent preamplifier, which is anything but the one inside your camera. So even the Zoom H4n has a really, really good preamplifier and you can perfectly find, and it's perfectly fine for use on film projects. Another thing is how high have to, do you have to crank up your levels? And uh, well, you have to try the loudest your actors will actually speak. You have to have them like shout or something and then just level so that the shouting does just does not clip so as loud as possible but you have to make sure that it doesn't clip because clip audio is terrible and you will hardly be able to reuse that ever okay so let's come to the third part which is digitalization I told you it's gonna be a bit theoretical but the easiest way to understand for filmmakers is so if you're recording a video just the frame you have a resolution and you have a re resolution in X direction and in Y direction, right? This is usually 1920 in X direction and 1080 in Y direction, which is perfectly fine. That's HD video. And for audio, you kind of have the same thing. So you have a Y axis and you have an X axis. Only the X axis is time, right? Because the signal usually moves in time. So there's a waveform moving in time. And the Y direction is the amplitude of your wave, so how loud a certain sound is going to be, basically. These are the two resolutions you have to take care of in uh, digital audio. Now, the first one, the time, is very simple, because it's just you have to look at the signal or the exact value of the signal at a certain frequency. So you don't take a number of pixels for this dimension, but you take a frequency, because it doesn't really end. Time can go on forever, and you don't want, like, 2000 pixels or whatever in that dimension you want one point every so and so millisecond so uh, The sampling frequency is exactly what this is. It's the frequency with which samples are taken from your audio uh, The sampling frequency that is usually used in video recording is 48 kilohertz and that is for a reason so if you divide 48 kilohertz by 2 you get 24 kilohertz or 24,000 Hertz and that is the highest frequency that you can still sample with 48 kilohertz. It's called the Nyquist frequency. If you really want more details of this, I can absolutely recommend the video done by Gratsky here. I'll, I'll put a link right here. But it's very technical and maybe you don't want to get into it. So 48 kilohertz is perfectly fine to get audio until 24 kilohertz. But, and this is a big but, you can go higher with your sampling rate. And there's a reason for that because usually uh, we only hear from 20 to 20,000 Hertz and 20,000 Hertz is not just 24 kilohertz yet, so there's still some room left. But in those 4 kilohertz, you have to dampen the signal completely down. Because if you still have signal beyond 24 kilohertz, it's gonna be mirrored back basically and you get this aliasing thing. 
you probably don't have to deal with aliasing because your sound card or preamplifier or whatever will do this filtering for you. But if you go to higher sample rates, you will have a, an easier filter and the signal will be less. Well, actually for, for 48 kilohertz, you will maybe notice that the very high frequencies will start to fall up, fall down a little. But this is not a big deal. So 48 kilohertz is fine for almost all recordings you can do. Now the Y dimension is also discretized into small pieces and that is called the bitrate of your audio. So really it's just 0 to say 1 as the maximum amplitude and that is separate and separated into if you have 16 bits 2 to the power of 16 small parts. Now this sounds a lot to the to the power of 16 that is like 200,000 something like that. But um if you, if you really look at it, it's not that much because you have a lot of amplification going on and if you have a signal that is just to the peak, then obviously you have 200,000 or 2 to the 16th uh, points left for that. But if you have a very low signal, there's a lot less points and this goes very quickly because especially the human voice has a lot of, uh, a lot of range, a lot of amplitude to it. So you have to be careful to choose at least 16 bits for audio recording. Normal video cameras do have 16 bits, which is fine. But if you can choose 24 bits, which is oftentimes the case for uh, external recorders like the Zoom H4n or the sound card, try to use that. All right, so let's wrap this up with some post-production. So the first thing that uh, people want you to consider sometimes is a headroom, which means that you should level in all your audio so that they are still at minus 12 decibels at the end of your video. Now this is fine if you want to give your audio, like if you only have the speech done and you want to have someone else do the music and then mix it together and everything, or if they still want to do some work on your audio whatsoever, then it's really nice to have some headroom because you can lift some frequencies and you can add some music without the sound clipping too easily. So you should leave some headroom for that. But if you just mix everything together like I do and then upload it to the internet, you don't need any headroom. You can go up to zero decibels maximum in the end. This is really fine and this is really cool. And uh, you should actually do it because otherwise your video will be really, really low. The, the sound of your video will be really low and it is also not what you want. So uh, let's get into some filters. I'm gonna go to my computer for that and I want you to just look at what we can do with filters. Okay, so I have pre-recorded some stuff for uh, exactly this purpose, to show you some filters. Uh, it's a very simple file and it sounds something like this. Now I'm talking very softly, I'm almost whispering. Now I'm talking at normal voice. And now I'm shouting! And this is silence. So uh, this has got everything we need and you can already see that the, this part is very, very low volume so the amplitude is pretty small, whereas this part is almost peaking so it's uh, like well peaked, well leveled, everything is fine. And <clears throat> yeah, the first thing uh, we would want to do with such a thing, so if you turn up the volume in, in, on YouTube you can hear that there's actually some kind of noise so there's some hissing in the background and I'm gonna try and get rid of that. And uh, therefore it is important that we record it actually some noise, some silence, what's supposed to be silence. Uh, so I'm showing you this in Audacity, which is a free program that anyone can get, but uh, basically all nonlinear editors and all sound systems do have the same capabilities. And it always goes something like this, you have to mark some section, and then just go to Effects. Uh, noise removal, this might be somewhere else, but it's usually like this, you have two steps. The first step is get noise profile. Uh, you can just mark a part and tell the program this is what noise sounds like. And then you can mark everything and go to effect noise removal again and take uh, the second step. So sometimes this is crammed into just one filter, but it's always the same thing. Uh, you should always check the preview. Now I'm talking at normal voice. So the noise reduction sounds fine to me. And if I click on that, you can see that the part that's supposed to be silent back here actually is silent. So you can tweak the parameters a little. Uh, the most important things to know about this is that um, for the noise removal, the noise reduction is how much the 
whatever the computer thinks is noise is actually dampened, so how much is it is reduced by. And uh, the sensitivity in uh, decibels is, well, in this case, it's, it's really just what the end result is going to be like. So for, for the input, it kind of knows that frequency smoothing and attack and delay time are, yeah, or decay time <clears throat> are absolutely fine. I wouldn't, wouldn't worry about that. So yeah, now, now we can see even clearer that this is at very low levels and this is at very high levels. And this is where the most important filter that everyone should apply to every spoken recording in every video, video whatsoever uh, comes into play. And this is a compressor. So uh, for video guys, a compressor works very much like um, curves would work on an image. So just as an example, if we go to a video here, this is what I'll be uploading later. I'm currently editing it. And yeah, so you have, uh, this is just the audio part here. Yeah, but it's the same thing. So I'm gonna go with Luma curves. Uh, so what you can see here is that usually if you're, if you're working with curves, you would maybe increase the contrast by taking down the uh, lows and taking up the heights a little. Uh, but if you do it the other way around, if you just take down the heights, and increase the lows a little. That means that the dark tones will get a little lighter and the very bright tones will get a little a little darker, which uh, makes for a very flat image here. Yeah, so you can see that the image is already very flat. And this is what we want to achieve because we want to increase the very low volume parts of our audio and we want to decrease the very high volume parts. And so we'll create something of a curve like this. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so basically any program has a compressor on board nowadays and you can use that. For example, Audacity, which is a free program, also has a compressor. And it looks very much the same. So there's this graph and the things mean the same things as for your curves adjustment. Uh, the threshold, there, there's a few sliders that are differently in, in audio, but there's a threshold here and the threshold is just moving uh, this exact um, part here. So it, it basically where the compression starts, you can move this to the left and the light and the right. If you have a lot of noise, you would you don't want to keep this too much to the left because then all the noise will be amplified too. In this case, we don't have a lot of noise because we had the noise cancelling already, and we can go to like minus eight, minus thirty eight decibels. That's fine. The noise floor is also nothing we need to touch yet. And then there's the most important slider, which is the ratio, and the ratio should be given in every one of the compressor filters that you can get. The other parts might. It differs slightly, but the ratio is fine. And uh, for speech, it's perfectly fine to go with a ratio of 4 to 5 to 1. And this is really just the slope of this upper part here. So uh, the higher you make this, the more the compression is going to be, the, the stronger the compression is going to be. Uh, yeah, keeping this around 4 or 5 is usually fine. And the attack time and decay time just mean uh, how fast the filter is going to act on sudden changes in the volume. and. Uh, yeah, 200 milliseconds is uh, fine for the attack time and the decay time. You only need to touch this for, for strange things like a bass drum or something, but uh, for speech, this should be perfectly fine as it is. And uh, then you need to make sure that this, here, here it is called makeup gain for zero dB after compressing. Sometimes it's called, called gain normalization or auto gain or something. Uh, it, this needs to be checked because otherwise you will just compress the thing and not move it upwards. Uh, Again, speaking uh, in the parallel version of curves, this would mean that the whole curve would be shifted up a little. So make everything a little brighter and uh, get rid of all the dark tones. And this is what we want to achieve in the end because the very soft noises uh, cannot be heard in comparison to the others. So we want to get rid of the soft noises. And yeah, so make up gain for zero dB after compressing. And if you do that, this will kind of be compressed like this. Well, actually, I think <laughs> I didn't didn't go far enough with the uh, compressor. So um, what I did here, you can you can already see that edit redo compressor. You can see that this part has been amplified a lot, whereas this part has not. And that means that maybe the noise ratio I was setting the noise noise threshold wasn't low enough. So I should try to get the the threshold as low as possible too. So I'm gonna undo that and go for compressor again. I mean, this is yet, now this is, this is uncomfortable because it's Audacity, it's a free program. You can probably do this better in, an, uh, in a better non-linear editor with nice, um, nice filters and plugins. 
So if I apply this, yeah, it works the same. You can see that uh, it's gotten louder in general, but especially the part where I'm talking normally has gotten louder. And uh, yeah, this is what it sounds like after compression and noise removal. Now I'm talking very softly. I'm almost whispering. Now I'm talking at normal voice. And now I'm shouting. And this is silence. Yeah, you can hear already that the, uh, the I, I would probably take down the noise removal because there wasn't a lot of noise in there and I went a little too far with the noise removal. But you can see that the, the levels are much more alike and it's much easier to listen to. So the compressor is like, in my opinion, the most important filter you have to apply, apply to speech because a normal instrument like a piano or a cello has a lot less amplitude range as the human voice, which is very, very... Uh, but it has just has a lot of range, which is cool, actually. So this is the second important filter. Uh, the third filter you can apply, and this is really nice here too, because you can hear if you if you listen to this once more. Now I'm talking very softly. I'm almost whispering. You can hear that the S's are very sharp in this case, and that is very common because if you are close to your microphone and you have explosive consonants like T or S or something like that, it's uh, very hissy and this is hard to get rid of and usually uh, um, editing software will have some kind of de -esser. Does this have one? I am not sure. Well, yeah, so I can ob obviously use those two, but I <laughs> won't. Yeah, so you can you can have a de in there. And this is another effect that I'm going to show you. And I can show you in, in Final Cut. So this is a de -esser. We can put that on there, for example, like this. And yeah, this is the, the uh, parameters for this are also very uh, simple. And the most important thing is the suppression and decibels. Uh, <clears throat> this will also mostly be there. The sensitivity you can play around if it doesn't catch the S's or if it's, it's corrected too strongly. The suppression uh, will adjust how much the compression actually takes place. So how much, how much the S's are reduced in the final version. Yeah. So this is the third filter that I w will most of the time will apply to recorded voices. <clears throat> the fourth one is an equalizer. You can do that too if you want to. So this is really anything has that so equalizer equalization. And this is oftentimes needed if uh, the low frequencies of a voice are kind of cancelled out. Because oftentimes if you record with a microphone that is not exactly at the source, then the bass voices will not be captured as, as nicely as if it were further away. And uh, <clears throat> you should know that the low tones of a human voice are somewhere in the range between 100 and 200 hertz. So uh, this 100 and 200 hertz is kind of where you want to, yeah, graphic EQ. 100 to 200 hertz is kind of, is kind of where you might want to boost things. In this case, this doesn't make sense because I was pretty close to the microphone when I recorded it. But you can boost this. You should be very careful with boosting frequencies. So uh, usually a, a rule of thumb is uh, if you do mixing, just take away frequencies that have some kind of peak that you don't want to have, but increasing frequencies is mostly not a good idea. So yeah, I'm going to leave this as is. I just wanted to show you. An equalizer might go a long way with uh, repairing audio that was recorded with a not so decent microphone or whatever. <clears throat> Um, and the last thing that you can apply is a limiter and a limiter is a really nice thing because uh, you don't want your audio to peak. I told you before if your audio peaks this, this will sound like crap. And uh, a leveler is, or a level is, <clears throat> limiter or leveler is included in every software. It's very simple and um, you can, well, this is a strange kind of level, I'll take this one. Limiter. So you can apply a limiter here and you can tell the limiter uh, at what amplitude it should just cut. So if I increase this suppression in dB, you can see here, uh, or not because it's after the, uh, before the compressor, no, it's after the compressor. This was actually the wrong parameter that I tweaked. So if, if you have a smaller end gain, basically, it will just limit your, your audio to be below 
in this case minus 14 dB in the end. This is really nice if you want to have some headroom later or if you want to make sure that you don't uh, just peek over the zero decibel line. So a limiter is what I usually apply at the very end of my video just before rendering. So uh, if, if it clips at some point it's just cut off by the limiter and it doesn't distort the audio. Yeah, so this is what I wanted to show you. As I said, the most important of these is a compressor. I can actually show you that for any of these audio files, this one here for example, I will certainly have... Uh, no, not yet, because I haven't worked on it yet. <clears throat> but I will certainly have uh, put a compressor on there. So this is usually what I, what I do the most. Just put a compressor on there. I can show you the Final Cut compressor just for fun, so you can see what it's actually what it actually looks like. <clears throat> um, yeah, so this is the, the compressor, and the parameters are very much the same as before. You have a threshold that you can put in. You have a ratio that I would take up to like four or five maybe. Yeah, and then you have attack and release. Release is the same as the decay time before, and it's at the same values almost. The attack is zero here, which is also fine. And the gain in the end is what you, what you want to, yeah. The gain is what you can adjust before before doing the compression. But then the auto gain is also set to zero dB. You can set the auto gain to automatically increase the volume to be at zero dB at the end. Yeah, and if you do that, you will again end up with a normal thing here, even though you put the limiter before. So <clears throat> the order in which you apply those filters in audio is also important. This is the same in video, but uh, usually you should try to have the limiter as the very last of your of your effects. So put this last. The compressor should be some, somewhere before the limiter, so bef after everything else has been done. And uh, it's, it's basically the same order I told you to do them. So you do noise removal, then you do de-essing, and then you do a compression, and then you might do some equalizing if you want to, and in the end you will have a limiter. <clears throat> so, and these are the most important filters I wanted to tell you. Well, thanks for making it this far in my video. If you still have any questions, please ask me in the comments. I also want to give a big shout out to Indy Mogul, who actually gave me the idea of doing this, because Russell Hasenauer, one of the hosts, says that he's not really an audio guy and he can't really teach you about audio and things, so I thought I know a lot about audio and I should maybe just give you some basic stuff that I think everyone needs to know. So uh, please check out their channel and subscribe to them. And uh, yeah, see you next time.